All right, very cool. All right, everybody, who has heard of Reason so far? Ooh, quite a few people. Very cool. All right, we're doing better than usual. All right. So those of, for those of you who have not heard, Reason is a new programming developer experience, they call it. It's kind of like a language, but not really. It's based on OCaml. It's from the same people who built React. Um, the goal is to have a very friendly syntax, extremely good tooling, both in the form of uh, editor integrations and in build tooling. How many of you have heard of OCaml? Oh, it's much better in Europe. You guys, yeah, you guys do it right. Uh, but how many of you guys have done anything in OCaml? <laughs> OK. And, and of the two that raised their hand, how many of you guys enjoyed it? OK, so zero. <laughs> so, so that's basically the goal with Reason. There are some good ideas in there, but it has not, like, people don't have a good visceral reaction to the name OCaml at this point. Uh, so first, I just want to start off with a quick demo to prove that this is Pac-Man complete. How many of you guys are aware of the term Pac-Man complete? So we all know Turing complete is not a very interesting definition for a language. Lots of very terrible languages are Pac-Man complete. Uh, it's only a cool language if you can actually build a Pac-Man demo in it. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. Uh, at least I don't have it. But how many of you guys know about uh, Witness, the game? OK. Uh, how many of you guys like the re prefix, the re? This is re-witness, re so you guys are going to love this, this one. But this is effectively just an OpenGL game. This is running natively. And this is OCaml code compiled uh, and running natively on OS X. I'll solve the maze. All of you guys should clap. That was very impressive, I think. <laughs> um, so we'll come back to why that's kind of cool a little bit later. Uh, some of the reasons that I like Reason so far. The first one is that it is a very, very fun language. Uh, if I think about programming, like inherently, I, I, I kind of like the idea of programming. But there are times where I reflect on it and I'm actually not really having fun programming. And if I try to separate those times, um, I wonder if some way, there's some way to eliminate the times where I don't have fun programming so I can focus on the fun parts. And I think Reason does, does a good job of this. Um, it is a statically typed language, but it, does, it, it works very, very hard to get out of your way. It doesn't try to block you. A lot of the time, I feel like typed languages are like, you know, like haters, like in the rap world, right? Like they're just waiting for you to fail, like just pointing out all of your failures, like, oh, you did that, you did that. Like you can't, you can't go. And they just try to stop you from, from progressing. What I want is the computer to help me, right? If I say this thing, um, x plus 1, right? So I want to assign that to y. And then later on, I say I want to concatenate uh, or add a string to y. Like, the computer should probably be able to tell me, hey, this is a stupid thing. I don't know what you, you meant to do, but this was probably not it. So I'm, I'm really looking for a type system that will maybe help me out along the way, uh, something like TypeScript, something like Flow. Um, so this is kind of like that, but it's built in from the ground up. And uh, the language encourages a functional style, but it doesn't demand it. So that means kind of at the edges, you can like munch things a bit. And this is really nice whenever you need to interact with mutative systems, things like the DOM or React or that kind of thing. And for those of you who are very uh, observant, you'll notice that I put in bold, it doesn't show up here very well, but really very fun. So kind of, uh, it's very subconscious. You guys won't notice it, but it's, it's getting in there already. Um, I, I basically liken the way reason works to like a robotic pair buddy. And I really like this idea. So to give you an example of that, whenever you're working in reason, oftentimes you match things, you do pattern matching. Uh, so the switch is the way that we do that in reason. Uh, let's say that we have a number, and we want to write a function called is odd, And we are going to enumerate every possible uh, case here. And so we're going to switch over it. And if it's 0, um, so actually, yes, it's false. And if it's 1, it's true. And if it's 2, it's false. And as soon as we hit save in any of our editors that have the tooling built in, it will tell us, wait a second, you, you missed the case. And it will actually give us an example of a case that we missed. It's like that generative nature just built into your, your editor. And in this case, uh, it's quite difficult to exhaustively enumerate all of the cases, um, but it's nice that it's, it's there. A more realistic example might be something like this. Say we want to have a pet animal function. Uh, we're going to make a type animal, so we have three animals, uh, and we write our function, and we're just kind of going along, we're doing our thing. Uh, if it's a cat, we're going to return an empty object. If it's a dog, we're going to return an empty object, and we're done, right? We're good. But as soon as we hit save, like our buddy is watching us. And he's like, hey, by the way, by the way, I noticed you forgot bird. Like, it's cool. It's cool if that's what you meant to do. 
but I just noticed that. I just wanted to let you know. Uh, whereas oftentimes in JavaScript, when I hit save, I will wait, and I'll wait, and I'll remember, oh, this isn't reason, and it won't tell me anything. So uh, until I run it in the, in the browser. Uh, it does other things. So if we have an animal and we have sounds that animals can make, we want to make a pet animal function, but we're going to return the sound that they make. So we return, if it's cat purr, dog pants, bird, and we return a string. As soon as we hit save, it's going to say, hey, by the way, this isn't uh, the same. Like one of these is not like the other. And based off of the way you wrote this, it looks like you probably meant a sound, not a string. The other case, oftentimes, in particular in a dynamic language, so I work largely in Clojure and ClojureScript these days, uh, which is fantastic. I, I love it to death. Uh, but one of the, the cases that um, can be scary is where you're coming across some code, and you're not totally sure if you can remove it anymore. You're pretty sure you can remove it, and you'd really like to remove it, but you're not sure. Um, and so what happens is like your code base kind of develops these growths around where like nobody is totally sure anymore if this code path is used anymore, but no one is willing to remove it. No one's willing to take that, just in case you hit an artery. Um, <clears throat> so what's really nice here, I mean, this is a, a very simple case. But for example, let's say we're switching on a Boolean. And we covered the true case, we covered the false case, and we have a third case. Our robotic pair buddy is going to be like, hey, man, like, you, can, you can take this off. I checked it. It's cool. I looked everywhere in your code base. You're not going to hit a runtime error with this, I promise. And it's really nice to have that, uh, that friend looking over your shoulder. But it goes so much further now. I had a designer friend who is getting into this uh, language now. And he designs, or he uh, calls reason basically hipster, what was it? Like hipster conformism. Iron-fisted hipster realism, I think is the idea. So <clears throat> to the degree that, hey, you guys can write your language however you would like, right? We're taking that function beforehand. We're going to switch over a Boolean. We're going to pattern match on true or false. But you could also write an if, this, else, that, right? Or you could write a ternary. You could have like, three different ways to, to represent this very, very simple part of the AST. Uh, as soon as you hit save, it's going to rewrite it to this. Like, there is no choice. Like, the, the language has decided that this is how we represent that case. There is no bike shedding. It's, it's done. It's like go format, but all the way up to the AST. Like, we're, we, we've decided how this is done. We're not discussing it anymore. So, it, I mean, it's, and it's very nice, right? Imagine, so a lot of companies have um, style guides that they check in that are text documents that they expect you. Like, whenever you ruin it or, like, whenever you mess up, they'll point you to it and say, hey, you should have followed that. You should have read that. And instead, what we want to do is encode that so that our editors do it for us. As soon as we write something syntactically correct, it should just write it for us. You know what the AST is. Just do it for me. I, oftentimes, I hate that the most, where the computer will say, you did this wrong. And, it won't, and I'm like, I know you know how to do this. Just do it for me. <laughs> uh, on top of that, so <clears throat> one of the crazy defining features of Reason is the just bizarre devotion to developer experience. So they really care about error messages. So I think Elm can take a lot of credit for this, uh, but they want to take this to an extreme. So <clears throat> for example, here is uh, the old Camel compiler saying that uh, on line 8 there, character 5, uh, you pass a string, but it wanted a Boolean. And really, that's all you need, right? Like, what more do you need? Uh, but they took this, and they're like, well, we can do better, right? Elm does better. Let's do better than Elm. Uh, and it's, it's a nice arms race, right? We want to keep improving. Uh, Elm has inspired everyone to do that. So basically, they go to, out of their way to make sure that the errors are as descriptive as possible. And in fact, even when there are warnings, it basically guides you through the warnings, tells you why this exists, and offers alternatives. The idea being that if you were sitting with someone who was experienced in this language and you were trying to learn, they would tell you these things. But oftentimes, whenever you're learning something new, you bang, like the process is that you bang your head against the wall for days until you find someone who spends five minutes and is like, oh yeah, just don't do that. And it's really nice to have that just kind of inside of the tooling, that everyone is used to this. All right. I have totally messed up the order of my slides, but we'll, we'll figure it out. All right, the other fun thing, <coughs> or beyond fun, is reach. So OCaml has crazy reach. How many of you guys knew that it can compile native apps? All right, come on, most of you guys, right? Like, I mean, what else does it do, right? But it also can reach unikernels. Anybody familiar with unikernels? Oh, a few people, very cool. So unikernels are kind of a new way of building applications. And the idea is, right now, whenever you develop your closure application, 
or your JavaScript application, or your Node application, rather. Whenever you deploy it to a server, generally it's going to be, we'll say, some form of Linux, you very, very carefully craft your application, right? You remove excess code. Uh, you try to make sure the surface area is as small as possible. You try to make sure that it's as efficient as possible, right? So you get it down to this tiny, tiny little thing. Very, very artisanally, very beautiful. And then you pull in 15 million lines of memory safe and type unsafe code called the Linux kernel, and you just slap it together. And you're like, all right, that will probably work. What, what could go wrong, right? Um, the alternative to this <coughs> is if you were to rewrite the Linux kernel, which is not really, I think, well, not what we're paid for. I don't know how many of you guys want to do it, but probably not many of you are paid to do it. Um, but there's a team actually out on Cambridge that have been spending the past seven or eight years rewriting everything from the ground up in OCaml. And so we have now pure OCaml implementations of TCP IP, of uh, TLS, of data storage, uh, lots of different things. So what happens is <coughs> the operating system is effectively compiled in at compile time. And you only pull in whatever libraries you actually need. So if you don't use SSL, you don't pull in the entire SSL library. And a lot of times people will say, for example, well, what does it matter that the Linux kernel is this big? Most of the time, I'm not using that code. Right? It doesn't matter if it's there. Uh, but there was actually a very big uh, vulnerability in the Zen hypervisor in the AWS cloud, if you guys remember a while ago, called Venom, which was an escalation that went through a virtual floppy disk driver. How many of you guys use a floppy disk on the cloud? Anybody? <laughs> no? <laughs> well, what does it matter that it was there, right? But actually, there was an escalation there that actually went all the way through the Zen hypervisor. It's really important that uh, if we can reduce the size of our applications, if we can reduce the size of our server and deployments, a lot of very interesting things come out of that. Um, not only that, but <clears throat> once you compile your application, there is no VM. Your entire application, from the hypervisor up, is your code. It's all OCaml. And then that means uh, that yeah, lots of your deployments, uh, cha stuff changes. So now, instead of millions of lines of code, we have tens of thousands of lines of memory and type safe code. S huge security implications. Much, much uh, reduced surface area, uh, and also means that the size of your artifacts are tiny, right? So how small can you get a Linux VM? Right, pretty small, but hundreds of kilobytes, like maybe a couple megabytes. Uh, like that's the default for writing unit kernels. Uh, and you don't do anything. You write OCaml code, and it compiles out and produces a VM that you boot up. Not only that, but every time that you deploy, you would take that unit kernel and you would push it to a Git repository and check it in. So now, if any like, error ever happens in production, you can literally check out that exact server state and reproduce it locally. Right? You never have to worry about what special Snowflake uh, configuration your server got into. Uh, not only that, but these unit kernels are so small and efficient that they can boot in roughly 50 milliseconds. Uh, this has very, very cool uh, ideas around for example, deployment and booting applications. How many of you guys know what the timeout is for a TCP connection? So for the initial reply, a packet comes in. Oh, OK. Well, I don't know either. doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> but I do know that actually we can boot a unikernel in a, a smaller amount of time. So literally, you can imagine we have no servers running. We have one load balancer. A request comes in for our server. We can literally hold that request, go off to our uh, hypervisor, boot an entire VM just for this connection, hand it off, and then as soon as that connection is done, kill the server. It will actually reply in less time than it takes to time out that initial uh, TCP connection. Uh, so that means that if you were trying to imagine scaling out uh, as you had a, the hug of death from Reddit or Hacker News or whatever, right? Literally, every connection that came in would get a new server, it would boot up, and then be instantly killed, and the resources would be returned to the rest um, afterward. And actually, that is for the current state of the art. There is actually a fork of this that boots in uh, about 20 milliseconds. And depending on how you configure your hypervisor, you can get it down to 5 to 10 milliseconds. How many of you guys have used AWS Lambda? All right. I, I haven't heard, I haven't used it very much. I actually wanted to get some, some feedback on it. But I've heard that if you really do a good job, like if there is a uh, JavaScript function that you have warmed up, that is uh, running and is primed, then you only pay about a 40 millisecond overhead for invoking that single function, which is pretty good. 
but if it's cold, it'll be maybe up to 10 seconds, we'll say. Um, in that time, we can actually boot our entire server several times over, several hundred times over. Uh, like, so we don't have to worry about scaling into individual functions. We can literally just launch our entire server. But there is a little bit more. Uh, we can also develop native applications that run on Unix. So just like I showed you that OpenGL application that was running, uh, that works uh, on Unix and on Windows, wherever you would like. Uh, also, JavaScript. There is a very, very impressive JavaScript story for OCaml, and therefore for Reason. One of the bad things about OCaml is that they basically have two of everything. And this is true of their JavaScript compilers. We have two of them. Um, but the one that is actually gaining momentum recently is BuckleScript. And it really focuses on smooth integration, right? Like the idea, uh, kind of like Elm, we know that the world exists. We need to know how to interact with it to bring it in so that we can actually gradually introduce uh, this new technology into an existing ecosystem. Nobody wants to throw away their existing investment in something, right? You want a smooth upgrade path. And it also focuses on clean generated code. And it's very, very serious about this. So a quick test. I'm going to show you two slides. You guys tell me which one is written by the computer. So this is a JavaScript slide. And this. Hands for this one. Who thinks this is written by the computer? And who thinks this one is written by the computer? All right, trick question. They both are. But you guys had to think about it. You all had to think about it. Uh, so here's the original OCaml syntax. Um, and here is the, uh, the second one. But it compiles down to what should appear as close as possible to be what a human would actually write, uh, barring some of the optimizations that it applies. And the reason for this is uh, Webpack is a great tool if you can get it running, um, as we heard earlier. Uh, <laughs> lots of the existing tooling, uh, like you're not going to get away from it. Uh, it's very important that we can actually still use it. And so, um, and in particular, Introducing a new language, something like ClojureScript, something like Elm, something like Reason, uh, may often seem uh, aggressive or scary to people who are kind of in their own domain. Like they don't necessarily want to take the time to learn this new thing that uh, may not make them more productive. They're already productive with their TypeScript and their JavaScript and whatnot. They don't want to take the time to, to learn this. So the idea is, how do you actually bridge the gap with these people? How do you make it so that you can present them something that looks reasonable that they can understand? And so uh, Reason takes this very, very seriously. Uh, and they also take the performance very seriously. Uh, so this is, I like this quote quite a bit, um, that you know, if we compare the speeds of the compiler for, say, TypeScript, hacks, everything, um, OCaml finishes before the rest of them finish starting up. Uh, it's, it will actually take your JavaScript, the hello world, and compile it much, much faster than anything else out there. So, the combination of that means that we have great semantics and all those robotic pair uh, buddy tools that we saw beforehand. That now follows as us into the JavaScript world. Uh, and in addition to that, we can actually go down to native ARM64. So we can still compile for x86, we can compile for JavaScript, but we can compile down to ARM64 as well, which means we can interop with native iOS and Android. And we don't pay any performance penalty or memory penalty for a JIT, right? Uh, OCaml is uh, sometimes worryingly uh, focused on performance. It has uh, an obsession with it. And so we know that we have a, this very, very highly tuned runtime that is going to be delivered and running on native iOS and Android uh, with no uh, hiccups or pauses from the JIT. And that means that we can actually take that same code. So this is the code I wrote, or that I showed earlier, running on a Raspberry Pi with no changes. That I can literally, I, all I did was boot up a Docker that had the um, compilation chain already installed, uh, compiled out a ARM64 binary, ran it, no problem. Uh, so we have the great ability to reach lots and lots of different disparate devices. Uh, we can run very, very efficiently on them. Uh, a lot of the time, we kind of overlook minute differences in performance. But in devices like Raspberry Pi, even though they get faster and faster, it actually does matter quite a bit if you can squeeze out every last bit. So <clears throat> uh, the last bit is just it's a very powerful language. Uh, it's very strangely um, one of the few languages that is situated well between being a systems programming language, where we can write or we can write TCP stacks with it, 
uh, stuff that is very, very performance oriented. But it also actually uh, lends itself very well to, say, higher level programming, uh, like interacting with React, uh, React Motion, that kind of thing. Uh, like I said, it has an obsession with performance that is worrisome at times. And it has uh, like very predictable characteristics in its performance. So basically, I would say that uh, recent kind of gives us very sound semantics. We have crazy reach. We can do unikernels, desktop, ARM64, like mobile devices. That's like there's very few places that we can't go with uh, reason. Uh, and on top of that, there is an absurd developer experience and how much uh, Facebook is actually investing in trying to make this a very nice experience for newcomers and uh, experienced people alike. So my pitch would be kind of like, if you are a JavaScript person and you're kind of like thinking about this idea, if you imagine that Flow and BabelScript were there from the beginning, um, like in a very nice language that wasn't working uphill against the language, uh, with great build tools and uh, deep inter editor integration, and had crazy reach. Right? So that's, that's reason. That would be the, the pitch. Uh, and then there is this question that if OCaml is so cool, uh, because it's not, it's not new. It's actually literally more than 20 years old. Uh, it was started shortly after me. Um, then like, where, where has it been, right? <clears throat> and I would argue that uh, you know, if it's so good, then it probably should have taken over. But it has spent most of its time, say, over here in the innovators area. There are a lot of PhDs written on OCaml. And academics are not super eager to get their work into industry a lot of the time. They've written the paper. They're kind of done. Right? Uh, there are some crazy people that have started to take it, the very early adopters, and have bled a lot right? as they've started to kind of polish the various bleeding edge parts. Um, but they, like, they need to get their job done. So this would be companies like Jane Street. Jane Street is a, are you guys familiar with Jane Street at all? It's a financial services company in New York. Uh, they care about performance to an absurd degree as you would if you were financially trading uh, things. Uh, but they also care about correctness a lot, which is why they chose OCaml and chose to kind of deal with the initial teething pains for the past half decade or so. Uh, but the problem is, <clears throat> over here, this is people who just want to get their job done. Right? Like they, they're looking for better ways to do it. Uh, they want to improve the, the state of the tools that they have, but they're not willing to kind of bleed out for years and years and years. Right? They have to get stuff done. And so this gap right here, that's where cool tech goes to die. And it's a very sad valley. There's a lot of cool tech in there. Um, but like, and there, there's a big chance that like OCaml uh, could stay in there. Uh, in fact, so a big problem with OCaml has been its ecosystem. Uh, it is traditionally a systems level programming language. There hasn't been a ton of focus on uh, user facing uh, applications. Uh, the mindset and cu culture is very heavily focused on that kind of stuff. And so kind of getting them to change their mind and to accept, say, that UI programming is an insanely complex domain and, has, and takes very serious engineering has been a challenge. Documentation, how many of you guys think types are documentation? How many of you guys think that types are sufficient documentation? Good. All right, you guys will fit in well. Uh, so OCaml did not think that for a long time. But Reason has done a very good job of, of saying that uh, it's documentation first. You can't just do a dump of types and be, and be done with it. Uh, and then the tools and the polish were lacking for many, many years. Uh, a couple of examples. I'm happy to go off over them a little bit later. Um, but uh, it doesn't really matter. So there are some cool, cool projects. Uh, everything starts with Re. If you guys are familiar with Clojure uh, and Line again, there, you are forbidden from starting a project that ends with Jure. Right? Uh, because I think Phil was just so tired of the idea. And we're going to need that very soon here, because everything starts with re. Uh, to the fact that we have like re-react. We have two re's even. <laughs> uh, but some cool ideas. So re.js, for example. Uh, the idea there is that, let's say that you want to take some JavaScript, and you actually want to port it over to Reason to get some of these benefits. A lot of the time, that is a very mechanical translation. Right? Uh, so what we can do is actually write a parser that will parse that and then emit reason code. It's not going to compile. It's not going to run. Right? Reason takes more information to be able to run. Uh, but it's going to save you from the, the mechanical part. So actually, you can jump start your transition very, very nicely. Uh, it's a huge benefit. And actually, relayout, uh, if you guys are familiar with the um, JavaScript implementation of Flexbox from Facebook, uh, was actually done that way, <clears throat> where it was started by hand. Someone came out with the re.js. 
And Jordan was like, oh my god, thank you, and just translated the rest over and then did it by hand. And so now we have a pure reason implementation of Flexbox. And we can take that, and again, we can compile that down to native, to JavaScript, um, to unikernel, so if we want to lay something back out on a unikernel. Um, and we have very nice build tooling in the form of Rebel. So I'm happy to talk about trade-offs. So I would encourage you to ask questions about how this compares to JavaScript, Clojure, or Elm afterward. Um, all right. And then there's a bunch of other cool stuff if you guys are interested in it. The syntax one might be kind of cool to talk about. Um, because reason is so, so the idea about reason is that we are all going to serialize to the same AST. That's why whenever you hit save, it's going to rewrite whatever you have to the standardized form. So we no longer have artisanally placed characters. Like this is all automated. And so we have to give up some of our ability to say, well, I like this character to be right here, and I want that character to be right there. Aesthetically, I find that pleasing. I want to accept myself from the rule this one time. But what you get from that is now the syntax is entirely programmatic. If you would like, you can parse this tree, this AST, and you can render it as closure. You can render it as JavaScript. And you can actually like edit. And then as soon as you hit save, serialize back to the standard form. And no one has to be any wiser, right? I, I vastly, vastly prefer uh, the closure syntax. It hurts not having par edit and a lot of my tools. Um, but like a lot of my coworkers may not agree with this. So the fact that I can see it in the form that I want to see it, and as soon as I save it out, they'll see it in their form, means that we can actually push the bike shedding and all of the silly. So the problem with syntax is it's a bit like food. Everyone feels entitled to an opinion about it, um, whereas not really with semantics, right? And previously with languages, the implementation of semantics has demanded new syntax. And those things are so kind of tightly um, knitted together that we haven't really realized that oftentimes they are separate concerns. You have to represent semantics in the AST, but the syntax is really a render time concern. So if we can do that, uh, then we can act, we're kind of in the let a thousand syntaxes bloom phase. And there's a cool uh, tool that actually lets you <coughs> program at, or visually design your own syntax in the browser and see your code printed as you're editing, kind of live creating a syntax. Uh, stuff like algebraic effect handlers are amazing. Uh, Spacetime is used by Jane Street. Uh, so again, they do financial instruments, and they really care about performance. So they have this tool that lets you profile your application and will literally show you, like the, uh, visually, the allocation of memory over time. And if you click on any of the allocation, it will take you to the line of code that is responsible for that allocation. So if you are wondering why you're pushing memory hard on iOS, for example, like this will actually show it to you and show you the lines of code and the stack trace that is responsible for it. So the level of tooling that you get from Reason is next level. Uh, and then there's some very cool multi-core stuff and a very, very um, new but aggressive uh, dead code elimination. The dead code elimination is so effective that if we were to take those unit kernels that I talked about earlier uh, and run it through this, it actually produces uh, entire VMs that are on the order of kilobytes. Uh, so now, like, you know, we thought hundreds of kilobytes was small, but we can get it down to kilobytes with an uh, appropriate standard library. And I have to thank these guys. They are responsible for a bunch of this stuff, uh, for helping me out. Um, and actually, they wrote this stuff. So this is Reason running in the browser. So it's not, uh, yeah, so the Reason. But uh, ReWitness, the one I showed you previously. Uh, this is a demo of, um, React Motion, you guys played with React Motion at all? So interacting with this is super trivial. I'll uh, give you an example of what this stuff looks like. Um, oh, there we go. All right, cool. So right now, like I said, the syntax of Reason uh, is loosely based on JavaScript. But because we have this very, very powerful parser and uh, serialized pipeline, means that we can do things like introduce JSX into this language very trivially. So this is valid reason. If you don't want to see JSX, you don't have to, right? You can use a different printer. But this means, so this just deserializes to an AST node that is calling create element. Um, but for those of you that would like to see it, you can. For those of you that would like hiccup, you can also do that. So you have this kind of very nice flexibility 
for the way that you want to represent your language. And I'll kind of show you some of the uh, things from before. So those examples I mentioned. Uh, so as soon as I hit Save here, it's going to say, so see, the, see these two empty lines here? It says no. Uh, so even comments are part of the AST. So those are going to be serialized, and it's going to put it where it should be. No one gets to decide. <clears throat> so I'll show you some of these examples. So this is one from earlier. If I hit Save, uh, let me see if I can make this a little bit smaller. So you can see that. All right, cool. So it says there's an error. So I'm going to jump to it. And it says that this pattern match is not exhaustive. And here's an example of where you forgot to check. So this is the other one. And same thing. Uh, you forgot to add in bird here. So here, um, it was a type string, but it's expected of a type sound. All right. This is one where it'll give us, oh, take care of that. All right, cool. Um, actually, that was a bit fast. All right, here we go. All right, so this is what I meant by we have a Schrodinger's cat. It has some number of lives. And we're going to peek inside of the box and see if the cat is still alive or not. Um, and that's going to be determined by some random booleans, either a true or a false. We're going to pattern match off of that. And based off of the result, we're either, if it doesn't, <clears throat> if it survives the peeking, uh, then we will just return the same cat. And if it doesn't, uh, then we will return a new cat with uh, one fewer lives. And if I hit Save on this, it actually rewrites that immediately to the standard form. So that's what I meant by there's no more worrying about this. And it's actually really nice, because as you're learning a language, oftentimes you're worried about precedence. It's like, what if I were to do, for example, uh, maybe 1 plus 1, and I want that to be there. All right, that's cool. And then I'm going to add that just to be safe. And if, as soon as I hit Save, it actually rewrite that and say, you don't need those parentheses. So kind of what happens is as you're editing it, it's like someone is kind of telling you and helping you, like, you don't need this. This is how we write it. And it's just you, you tend to develop a muscle memory much more quickly because of this. You have immediate feedback onto how are you actually supposed to be writing this language? How are the sem are semantics actually exposed? And then, I mean, it does lots and lots of warnings. So for example, this is the same case. But we're using um, the spread operator here, which does the same thing as in JavaScript, where we're going to take that previous cat and we are going to um, decrement one of the lives. But lives is the only field there, right? So we don't really need that, um, that spread operator. So it will actually tell us that, hey, by the way, you're doing this operation, and this isn't really necessary. Right? All you've done, like you've already enumerated lives here. That's the only thing that's in there. So just like as, as if you had had, like if you did this big refactoring, you ended up with only one of these fields. You had a spread from before. You pushed a review. One of your coworkers would say, hey, why are you doing this? You don't need it anymore. Uh, this will save you that. Right? Like this is just getting that feedback immediately. How many of you guys are familiar with Closure Cup? Oh, no one. Oh, OK, cool. Well, you guys should definitely be part of this. But So Reason Cup is a distributed programming event. Um, the idea is you form a team of up to four people, and you just hack on something. Um, like a game or uh, an app or whatever. If you guys are familiar with Precursor, the Clojure app, uh, it actually came out of Clojure Cup. So this is the same idea. Um, and this is the first year we're going to hold it probably sometime in December. So it would be awesome if you guys were able to join us and uh, give it a try. You try all these, this editor stuff. There's a great Discord to help everyone kind of get started um, if you need it. Thank you.